All right, take it away. Welcome. Good to see some familiar faces. I'm Katie Jones. I'm the Health Projects Coordinator at UAA Center for Human Development. I am a family member. My brother has Down syndrome. He's older than I am. I was a parent navigator at Stone Soup Group and facilitated the Friendships and Dating program prior to this role that I'm in. And I've worked in the field and with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities for about 10 years now. And I'm Kelly. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelly Hartlieb. My role at the Center for Human Development is the Justice Projects Coordinator. And so part of my work is helping to support the Friendship and Dating Program as a matter of, of justice for our, our folks with intellectual disabilities. I also specialize in raising awareness and programming around um, preventing abuse of people with disabilities. And, and so I coordinate a project called DART Disability Abuse Response Teams, uh, which we have eight now around, around the state. My background is in domestic violence, sexual assault. I also have had over 13 years of direct uh, experience working in a clinical setting with women with intellectual disabilities who have trauma histories and, and need um, skill building around how to have so safe relationships. So this is a subject that both Katie and I are very passionate about. And so we're, so we're very, very glad to have, have you, your interest and to tell you more about the program. Well, since it's such a small group, we can just kind of chat about this and not necessarily go all the way to the Mentimeter. So just curious, what, how you guys feel about friendships and dating and sexual health when it comes to your kids, the kids that you work with or support, whatever your role is. So what are some of your hopes? You can unmute, you can put them in the chat, whatever. You and I wonder if we could, just so we have a sense of who we're going to be spending the next hour and a half with. Um, if you wouldn't mind in the chat also putting your name and your role, if it's parent or some other um, professional role that you have, that would be useful for us as we go through. I see. Hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Whoever's in the room. Yeah. Love to hear where you are. If you're, if not in Anchorage, Katie and I are based here in Anchorage uh, at UAA, the indigenous land of mm -hmm. the Athabascan people. So um, yeah, if you'd like to unmute, go, go right ahead. So this is my son and he has Down syndrome and he has autism and he's nonverbal and he's 22. Oh, and then this is Hi. sister, Hello. six year old. <laughs> and then the dog bounces around around here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a nice family scene you've got. And the dog's name. <laughs> Okay, it's great to have all of you. Thank you for introducing you. yourself. Then we have a parent of a 19-year-old with Down syndrome, and they live in Wasilla. Mm -hmm. here. Looks like we also have Ellen on. Yeah, are there any specific hopes or fears that come to mind when talking about these subjects that you guys would like to share? Well, Second. for us, Go ahead. Mm -hmm. he doesn't have a lot of interaction skills with virtually anybody, <laughs> so he doesn't have He'll have, he's had friends at the act and now that he's not in the act, he doesn't get to interact with them. Mm -hmm. But Miss uh, Cal, um, not Miss Callie, Miss um, Ty, one of his teachers or one of the, somebody else, she'll text me every now and then and say, hey, we're at the Lisak library and we happen to go there and just meet up. <laughs> so he can at least see, because there's a couple of people still in the act program that he just lights up when he sees. So I love that interaction. And I'm his personal caretaker during the day and his um, day pr provider. So it's good that I know where they're at so he can get those interactions even just during the day. Yeah, it's definitely hard once, once you've transitioned out of that school environment, keeping up having social activities and being friends with people and how do you encourage those from to happen? And him being nonverbal, he's not actively telling me he wants to go see his friends. So I never know what's really going on inside this little head of his. <laughs> what he, I give, I do try to give him choices by asking him, and he'll respond sometimes, or he'll not understand. But when I say, 
oh, hey, let's go to the library. He's he's out the door. And then when his friends are there, that's even a bigger surprise. So those are always pluses when I can catch his friends. But just him wanting to go out in the world and meeting anybody is like, Ooh, that's kind of scary. <laughs> Well, clearly there is enthusiasm for connecting with, you know, peers, just so normal and natural and important. So yeah, hopefully, you know, we can uh, offer some ideas, some support around <laughs> around that. But, you know, it feels like, as Katie said, once we leave the, you know, environment that, you know, is uh, naturally full of uh, other people, life really changes and it can be hard, right, to connect. But finding opportunities, you know, intentionally to make those connections is, is so important. And you can, you know, you can tell the effect it has when, when we light up and we we feel, we feel connected and we feel, you know, that, that fills us up. So, okay. So we, do, oh, I guess the question was if anybody uh, has any particular hopes, what are, what are your hopes for, for, or for, for your kiddo, your young adults, I should say, um, what are your hopes around friendship, dating, healthy sexuality, if you would like to share those? Oh, and if you didn't see um, in the chat, Kelly has a 16 year old with mm -hmm. autism and ADHD who goes to Palmer. Perfect. They're not. Don't know if he's interested in dating yet. That's no problem. As the title suggests, we, you know, acknowledge that friendship skills are kind of a precursor to dating skills. They're all interrelated. They are kind of a foundation. A lot of times folks uh, maybe are, are primarily interested in just connecting through, via friendships. And so, yeah, I think, you know, building friendships Clearly there, there's an interest in that topic. And so we will definitely be touching on that. I know as a parent myself of two young adults now, I can remember some of my hopes for them in terms of, you know, wanting them to grow into adults who um, had meaningful connections with other people that were healthy and that they had some understanding about, you know, what, what their rights were in relationships and how to, you know, hopefully learn some information to protect themselves from things that are, that worry parents <laughs> and that um, they can make good decisions. Um, I had a lot of those hopes for my kiddos still do. Uh, that never ends. Right. And that they could um, kind of grow uh, into, you know, have, have, good positive relationships in their life as they move away from their parents, right? Into independent people, more independent. And so I remember too, though, you know, there's a lot of fear. I, I recall at least. So a little background on me. I also uh, teach a comprehensive sexuality education course. We focus on middle school age youth as well as high school age youth. I've done that for uh, about 12 years. And even as an instructor who talks about th um, these subjects regularly with young, young people, when it was my own children's time to take this course, I was like, wait a minute. I was nervous. They're not yet. They're too young. Like, oh gosh, oh no. You know? And so <clears throat> I totally relate to, you know, the concerns that parents have about like, are they ready? Uh, is this appropriate? Uh, if we start talking about it, it's going to open up a can of worms. So those are some of the things that we find common parents or, you know, support people, guardians about, you know, what we, we want good things. We want good relationships for those we support or, or you know, our, the, our loved ones and some nervousness about, are they ready? Do they have the skills? And so um, we'll be addressing some of those things as we go along. Please feel free to uh, type anything into the chat box or unmute yourself. Obviously, we're going to be a casual group here, which is wonderful. We love we love that opportunity just to chat and share ideas. So thanks. Shall we go ahead and jump in, Katie? Yeah, we really like to use this quote at the beginning of all of our presentations. And it's just really highlighting the fact that relationships and sexuality are a human right. People with intellectual and related developmental disabilities, like all people, have inherent sexual rights and basic human needs. 
these rights and needs must be affirmed, defended, and respected. And that comes from a joint statement from the ART Congress of Delegates and the AAIDD Board of Directors. Interpersonal relationships are really important. We're social animals. Humans need to feel love and acceptance from social groups. Having those needs met is really connected to people's physical and mental health. And there's a lot of evidence that shows a, a link between those. So we need human touch and social connection in order to thrive. And they really also, relationships also really help us to develop a sense of self. There's a lot of different ways that we identify somebody's daughter or friend, um, coworker. And so those, those identities really help people to feel like they belong and have a purpose and meaning. So another kind of philosophy that is embedded into the friendship and dating course and is the idea of dignity of risk. And if, if you can give me a thumbs up, if that's a concept that you've heard of before or know about or explored, just that idea of dignity of risk. It's kind of a buzzword um, maybe uh, these days, but an important concept that we really support, which you know is the idea that it's important for people who are growing and maturing to have to encounter risk in their life. And so that, you know, we know that taking risk is a part of learning and growing and uh, developing as autonomous being. And it's important that, you know, we, we do balance risk taking with, with protecting a person's health, health and welfare, but oh, people can't grow if they're not allowed opportunities to sometimes mess up frankly, right? So if, you know, on a personal level, thinking back about, you know, our own uh, friendship and dating journeys, I can imagine, you know, it's typical that we'll have some, you know, like some false starts or breakups or, you know, things that we look back on now and maybe just go, oh my gosh, what was I thinking kind of things. And those are important for everybody to experience. And so we really do you know, encourage the perspective of uh, if we don't take risk, we're never going to grow. And so we want to make sure that we have that framework in mind as we are looking at supporting people with with friendships and, and dating relationships. So we know, you know, Hala, you had just mentioned a barrier that, you know, so many encounter, especially once they transition out of school. And now, you know, there are fewer opportunities for structured interaction with peers and other people. And, and we know that, you know, isolation and loneliness is a real challenge for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We, you know, really got a, a huge taste of that, even, you know, more uh, compounded during COVID times, right? And could really... Un I think the population in general could really understand the negative impacts of feeling isolated and lonely. And we know just frankly that there are fewer uh, opportunities for, you know, that our, our loved ones, those that we support to uh, engage, interact socially. And so they don't uh, maybe have the same uh, number of, you know, uh, opportunities to practice those skills, being invited for sleepovers or going out, you know, on, on a, being, in, you know, invited to, to different things on the same kind of frequency as, as others may have. So we also are looking at, um, you know, I know that personally, the uh, sex ed and relationship skill building for this population is also uh, not, you know, um, not being promoted in the schools uh, as for people with intellectual disabilities, as with others, just talking with the Planned Parenthood educators here in Anchorage. And, um, you know, they had a realization a, a couple years ago, they go into the school district and present to the middle school and even elementary school about, um, you know, safe touch, unsafe touch, different aspects of, of safe dating and that the realization that they hadn't been invited into the special ed classes and you know why why was that they once they realized and so you know they're committed to to making curriculum that is you know useful for the special ed classes as well and i think i said planned parent i meant to say star standing together against rape is the the um facilitators i was talking to Anyway, the point is there are lots of barriers and we know this for our folks. And so 
you know, that therefore we um, have developed a course like this and there are more coming along all the time that are, you know, the, the uh, interest in this kind of course is growing and which is good news so that we can hopefully start, you know, kind of breaking down some of these barriers and helping people get the information and opportunities that they need to, to learn good social skills. Oh, okay. This is still me. Okay. Well, <laughs> so another thing that we know is that information helps protect folks, right? So some, as I said earlier, you know, wondering, gosh, what should we share? How early should we start talking about these things? If, but we know when people don't have factual information about their bodies and about relationships, then they are more susceptible to bad things happening, right? So we need to be thinking about empowering folks with information so uh, that they know how their bodies work, that they know um, what is normal for them and how to keep their bodies healthy, that, you know, they can have an opportunity to ask questions about what is going on, um, you know, as they're developing, as they're uh, experiencing normal physical and physiological responses, and that they know, you know, kind of, they have models, they have understanding about what constitute constitutes a safe, healthy relationship and what is, is not. So, so they can distinguish between, you know, different behaviors that might be abusive and that they know that that's not right. So this, you know, information is, is so important so that they can make informed decisions about, about their bodies and about the relationships they engage in. You're going to hear that on the side here, it says healthy, safe, and legal. This is a framework that's going to come up as we go through. We've adopted it kind of as a way for, for you know, parents, guardians, caregivers to have objective conversations about uh, with their young people on topics about dating and sexuality. You know, if they're, you know, potentially say engaging in risky behavior or wanting to do X, Y, or Z that we can kind of break down what's going on in terms of, okay, how healthy is this for you? How safe is this for you? Is this something that's legal? And that's the kind of information we want to arm our, our young adults with um, to, to make sure that uh, that they're staying safe and healthy. Right. Um, so you can see from these um, charts here, um, CHD collected 10 years of data from participants of the Friendships and Dating Program. And the evidence was very clear that um, this sort of information increases social networks and also decreases incidence of interpersonal violence. And those were measured at the beginning of the program, at the end of the program, and then 10 weeks after the end of the program, they were asked again, and those numbers still stayed elevated. And Kelly already mentioned, you know, if, if we're not talking about these things, this information is going to come from somewhere, um, and those sources could be unreliable or harmful sources. People are getting their information from their friends, from school, from porn, from TV, from whoever, um, and we want to make sure that they're getting accurate information so that they are avoiding increased risk around being taken advantage of, groomed, or victimized. Um, and then also, it can be an issue of involvement in the criminal legal system. And if people aren't aware of appropriate boundaries, um, the uh, age of consent, and just a various number of things where they should or shouldn't be masturbating, just all of these different concepts that if nobody's ever talked to them before, talked about them before, they could get you in trouble. And so you want to make sure that people are, are not only avoiding being victimized, but also not victimizing others. And what self advocates want? This is these are the things that the that people have expressed that they want. They want access to information about sex, including safe sex practices, different types of relationships, and different sexual orientations. They'd like to see systemic barriers removed, having accessible clinic locations um, to obtain information, having guardian support guardian and support network acceptance of their needs um, and having professionals treat them with respect. They'd like to see more education for healthcare providers, guardians, and staff. And they'd like access to counseling, um, whether that's therapy or just somebody to be able to talk to about 
relationships and being able to discuss their feelings in a safe space. And then they want opportunities to express their their sexual needs, having private space, private time, and having opportunities to build skills around dating. So I love this video. and I really just wanted to share it with all of you. I'll see what you think afterwards. <laughs> Just the two of us We can make it if we try Just the two of us You and I I see the crystal raindrops fall And the beauty of it all And when the sun comes shining through Just the two of us Any thoughts on my video? <laughs> I love it. It's really just about acknowledging that there's a balance that has to be found between people not having enough support to experience these things on their own, but also not having too much interference and overprotection. And it's definitely difficult to try to find that kind of in between. Yeah, I know. I think, um, you know, just as a person who has sat in lots of team meetings with lots of uh, different people, uh, um, you know, who are invested in a person's safety and well-being when it comes to, you know, wanting to date. I've seen, you know, sometimes the room gets pretty crowded with people who have their opinions about, uh, you know, what, who, how, and what, at what pace. And so that video always just tickles me a little bit because it just shows, you know, a lot of times it doesn't necessarily need to be so, so uh, difficult. <laughs> so... All right. So we're going to move on now to, uh, so what's your role? And, you know, we might have different roles, obviously, if some of us are, you know, in a, a parental role or a support role, guardian, um, et cetera. But ultimately, you know, what we all want is to help folks leave, lead self-directed lives as much as possible, right? And to be able to participate in in all aspects of their community. And our role is really to support them and be a life-affirming resource so that they can, you know, explore different aspects of building friendships and interpersonal relationships and sexuality in a way that's healthy, safe, and positive. So, you know, helping to make sure that they have information that's important for them to be able to do so, making sure that they have uh, resources for who they can go to, to, you know, to ask questions that they might have, to get uh, important, you know, factual information and to help support them in, you know, facilitating opportunities to get together with, with peers. Thanks. So when we've done this training with guardians and, you know, we, we know that guardians, legal guardians have important roles to make decisions for health and well-being. But it's also important that we lift up and understand the core human rights of everybody who has a guardian. And so, uh, you know, it's important that we acknowledge that those that we support have the right to sexual expression and to have that be respected and to have privacy for, you know, intimate parts of their life. We know that, you know, guardians are again invested in the, in their safety but there's there's a few things that it's interesting that sometimes people don't recognize that folks who have guardians are able to do without guardian permission and that includes the ability to get married and get divorced and the and making the decisions about abortion and sterilization so 
just as a matter of fact, in, in the you know time that I supported folks directly, when there was guardian resistance about wanting to date, w- wanting to have certain relationships, when there was guardian resistance, I have personally seen a handful of people decide just to go down to the courthouse and apply for a marriage license and get married because that was something that their guardian wasn't able to say no to. And when you think about that, a pretty dramatic step to take just so that two people who want to be together can assert that right to be together. But then there's a lot of scrambling that has to happen um, afterward to figure out, okay, now this is this is the reality and how do we support it now? Whereas if, if we can help support their rights incrementally along the way, then we can kind of set them up for a better, a better journey um, with their interpersonal relationships. All right. So having conversations, parents and guardians talking about these things is really important. So we wanted to give you all some tips to guide these conversations. Um, and then we'll get into talking more about the program itself and how we can have these conversations. So kind of a framework to start with, people experience different types of behavior, um, communication, expectations, and then activities in their relationships. And so the goal isn't to fit your relationship into one specific outline, but to strive for a healthy relationship that makes both people feel supported and appreciated. So you're wanting to normalize discussions, avoid having the talk, that gets really awkward. Um, These are ongoing and lifelong conversations. So they're things that you can start early on. Um, There's different, different topics, different stages of development that are, that are good. Things like consent and bodily autonomy are things that you can start talking about at a really young age. So definitely take advantage of teaching moments. Um, There can be different things that you see out in the community or when you're watching TV. And you can use those as opportunities to talk about some of these things. And remember to be approachable and remain calm. Um, things are awkward. Some cate- some topics are really shocking or questions can just really throw you off. And so just remain calm, take a breath, think about it before you respond. Continue to be approachable by not having really negative reactions. To them. And we'll get into um, more about being a resource, but just know that have all the answers and that's okay. But knowing where to find positive and accurate information is really helpful. And then again, focusing on healthy, safe, and legal, just remembering all of those different, all of those different relationship types and how they can look so different and values are really different. And, and how can we support people with what they, they as a healthy, safe, and legal relationship? some tips to have these conversations. So in that first framework there was normalizing discussions. So Kelly can share some about that. You bet. I was just um, typing in the chat and just want to acknowledge, we're kind of just talking about our, you know, kind of a general framework and some general tips about these kind of conversations, but definitely want to acknowledge that everybody's at different places of readiness, of interest. And so we really do kind of talk in in broad generalities. Some people are, are already there, right? And so we have to kind of acknowledge the whole scope. But I think maybe, you know, when we unpack kind of the program elements, there might be things that potentially feel like they could be a good fit for wherever, you know, the folks we're supporting are, because we do kind of, we do pretty much start at a, at a pretty uh, neutral level of really basic funda- fundamental social skills. And so if you stay tuned, maybe you'll, you'll see something that, that you think could potentially be useful. Okay. So conversation tips. So we, whoops, first of all, you know, want to acknowledge that we all bring to this topic our own values, our own belief systems, and, and that's perfectly fine. We're, we're not asking anybody to adopt any uh, specific set of values, but what we are, what we encourage our friendship and dating facilitators to be, as well as parents, to be open and approachable and as much as possible, non-judgmental, um, non-reactionary if, you know, our, our 
loved one or the person we're caring for brings up a, com a topic or a conversation to not automatically like, oh my gosh, okay, this must mean something's going on, right? To, but to, as Katie said, take a breath and just uh, be a person who can, first of all, engage. And so, you know, if it's not you that can talk about these things easily, that's okay. But if it's not you, then who is able to do that? Who in your uh, support circle is someone who, you know, has an easy time talking about dating or sexuality? Um, because it's important that that everyone has someone that they can go to. And it's important as well to really normalize these topics because it is a normal, natural, important aspect of, of, you know, human experience. And so, you know, there might be connotations associated with bodies or sexuality that is, um, you know, that's something that's, we don't talk about that's inappropriate or that's, that's nasty, those kinds of things. We want to just normalize that sexuality is a normal part of life, natural, and it's, totally appropriate to be curious and be interested and to support, you know, even if we don't have the answers or even if we're feeling uncomfortable to say, you know what, um, I'm really glad that you asked that question. This, these are important topics and it's okay to, to feel uncomfortable, right? That we're all human. So um, having these conversations, while they're important, they're not always easy. So um, we can acknowledge our own feelings um, when we're, you know, either introducing some of these topics um, this is point number two now, Katie, to say if if you know that this is, you know, challenging for you, it's okay just to to say, you know, I get I this is this is something that's hard for me to talk about. But again, you know, um your your feelings matter and this is important stuff for us to talk about. So let's just, you know, do our best, maybe, you know, insert some humor when we're able to, but just acknowledge that that's not always easy for everybody. And then the next thing is to really model always good boundaries and what consent looks like in everyday life. So this is the next point when we're engaging. Some of the topics that we're going to talk about that is embedded in the program, the friendship and dating program, you know, actively demonstrating those things such as consent uh, in everyday life, asking for permission, acknowledging the response and, and finding, you know, when when things come up, finding those teachable moments to have conversations can be a good way to kind of enter into some of these topics. For example, if you're watching a program and there are uh, examples in the program of people engaging in healthy relationship dynamics or unhealthy, or if you're in the car and some song lyrics come on and, you know, you have a moment just to say, wow, is that really what they're saying in this song? Is that, gosh, I wonder if, if um, you know, that person that they're talking about feels respected with that kind of language, you know, having opportunities as they arise just to kind of insert some curiosity and get conversations started. Being a resource. Something that's really important is using the language of anatomy. Um, this is really important for concrete thinkers um, to avoid ambiguity and make sure that there is no confusion using um, accurate body part names is really helpful to make sure that everybody's on the same page about what we're talking about. You don't, you don't want to be confused um, in that area. So you also want to be a resource for accurate information. We don't want to scare people. The goal is to empower them. And so if you're not sure of where to find that information, you know, it's okay to say that. Well, I, I don't know. Let's find out together or let's call up Katie and Kelly and ask them where to find that information. And we don't want to be scaring people to just avoid having sex or relationships. Yes, they're scary, but we don't want to just tell people not to do those things because they're going to do them anyway. And then checking for understanding can be really helpful. After you've had a conversation about something, you know, verify, tell me what you understand about this thing we just talked about. And just making sure that it was heard 
what you were trying to relay. And then also when they're telling you things, re reiterate that back, paraphrase it. What I hear you saying is this, and just make sure that that understanding is there. And utilize resources to aid these conversations. You don't have to do them all on your own off the top of your head. There's lots of visual aids and videos and websites friendships and dating program. And we have a ton of resources that we'll share with you um, so that if you are wanting to have these conversations at home, just want to know a little bit more of kind of how to do that. We'll definitely share some, some more resources for that. Okay. Just a few more tips for you all to think about, but again, uh, the idea of reinforcing messages about what's healthy, safe, and legal. So, you know, supporting um, uh, folks to have health screenings that include sexual wellness for uh, making sure that uh, folks are familiar with their bodies and can pay attention to what feels normal to them and kind of understand how bodies work. Again, as we said earlier, we know that self-advocates are wanting to have people that on their side that they can talk to about these subjects. So maybe that, you know, their doctor uh, is a good resource for Talking about, you know, what's normal body functioning and development and, and you know, screening for things like healthy relationships or uh, potential abuse and having those conversations and making sure that, you know, you, you pre-teach or maybe talk about what to expect before going into those consultations with doctors. And, and again, some of the, the legal conversations that are, that are important, what's private versus public behavior, and also making sure that, you know, again, just to reiterate that it's okay for people to have their own set of values. Having conversations about um, those things can be really helpful to help people kind of even reflect on what they think is right or wrong in terms of, so, you know, what do you think about people dating before a certain age or people having PDA, public displays of affection in public? Like, how do you feel about these things? You know, um, again, those teaching moments. And when we say be proactive, oops, I think I'm already down to eight and nine. I think it should be, oops, we skipped nine. That's okay. 10. Um, be proactive. This is a, a suggestion for those of us who support people within a support plan where we have an opportunity to include healthy sexuality goals so that, you know, when we're talking about how can we help support people to reach their goals that we're not overlooking that there, there are possibly goals around, I want to make new friends, or I'd like to see the friends that, that I already have, or I'd like to, you know, my long-term goal is to get married one day. Um, whatever the case may be to acknowledge that this is a, you know, important aspect of a person's life and that we can, you know, actually put them, um, codify them into a plan where we can help them take steps. Are there any questions about any of this so far? Any concerns or any thoughts anyone would like to share up to this point? We're kind of, we acknowledge we're throwing up, you know, some general ideas are uh, the philosophy behind friendship and dating. We're going to now get into kind of the structure of the program itself, how it's set up. Um, and we're also going to be offering a lot of tips and more tips and resources that are part of the friendship and dating um, package and also other, other places that you can go to look for information, support activities. So yeah, to give you the message that you aren't alone, there are lots of resources out there to help support these conversations. So the Friendships and Dating Program, what is it? <laughs> it's an evidence-based program and that supports people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to create and maintain healthy relationships. So we're teaching social skills um, to develop healthy, meaningful relationships, as well as to prevent interpersonal violence. The program was launched in 2008 and was created in partnership with provider agencies who were looking for some way that they could um, teach this information. So the fundamentals of the program is that it's positivity-based education. It's really focused on the healthy and fun aspects of relationships. Again, not trying to scare people out of having sex or relationships. That dignity of risk. Relationships are risky. 
and people have the right to take that risk. And so um, education is really about helping to mitigate those risks. So it's also inclusive and welcoming. People may have different values, different sexual orientations, may just want different things out of relationships. They may or may not want to date. They may just be looking to make friends. Um, and so really, we're, we welcome different experiences and views and really talk about that people do have these differences with the participants to help be able to communicate and be accepting out in the community as well. And again, focusing on healthy, safe, and legal. The format of the program is, um, it's a 10-week program, two sessions per week for an hour and a half. So the first session of the week is in the classroom, and it's all focused on skill building around the topic of that week. And then the second session of the week is a community outing where they're in where you're then taking the skills that were learned in that classroom session and applying them out in the community. It's been adapted for a lot of different environments, and the program is preventative in nature, um, but it is a non-therapeutic intervention. So it wouldn't necessarily be the most appropriate um, group for somebody who has a history of problematic sexual behavior, but otherwise it's so then the structure of the program itself is it's co-facilitated by two people so that there is the ability to break the group up if needed. We like to see six to eight participants in each group um, with a mixed mixed genders and ages and experiences. And then the big part of that is that it is something that is voluntary. We want people to want to come. We don't want participants to be told that they have to be there, that it's a requirement. We want them to want to be there. We use a multimodal approach. So we use lots of different types of um, activities and games and discussions that are interactive to help keep things interesting and also meet a wide variety of abilities. And then we also provide information for the support networks for you, for parents, staff, whoever it is that's supporting, supporting the participants so that they know what to expect during the program and then how to guide the conversation at home afterwards. So um, weekly information sheets are sent home at the end of each at the end of each week talking about, you know, these are the, the topics that we talked about this week. And here are some ways that you can ask questions about it um, to kind of keep that conversation going. So the session topics, the program really is meant to go in order, starting from the bottom here. It's kind of a stair step. We start really with the basics, um, like how to identify emotions, communication, how to make friends. And then we move up into more complex topics like dating and how to recognize healthy relationships. We really work to build trust among the facilitators and the participants so that as they explore these different aspects of all types of relationships, there is there is that trust that's built before they're getting getting into more difficult topics like abuse and sexual health. And you can see here that sexual health is way there, way up there at the top. It is just one part of many different aspects of all different types of relationships. And so although it is important to educate on, there are just so many other things that need to be covered um, to help folks have healthy relationships, regardless of whether they're romantic or sexual or not. So we have uh, lots of different games and activities, like I said. So Kelly, I'll let you. Yeah, continue. here's so um, as Katie was mentioning, we the topics are covered. We have lots of options for facilitators in terms of how they present the topic. And so here's just one example of an activity that can be modified uh, according to you know the, the pr program participants. We absolutely encourage the facilitators to make changes you know, whatever uh, will work best for their group. But this is um, just an example to show you a way, to, you know, that we make talking about boundaries engaging. So what we would do is ask uh, maybe Nalani, would you be willing to put in the chat box three different numbers ranging between one and six? So pick three numbers between one and six and put them in the chat box for us, if you if you would. I'll hide the answers for a second. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, yeah. 
one, four, six. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. So, and that we're just doing it this way because we're, um, you know, electronic, but we would maybe roll, roll some dice in the group together um, and see what we came up with. So in this case, you chose one. So we're going to just imagine a scenario where one is a teacher, four is hugs you, and six is on the sidewalk. So imagine, imagine your teacher hugs you on the sidewalk. And then we would ask, you know, the person who had that scenario. So how does that feel to you? What, you know, what kind of, what are you thinking if this were to happen? How comfortable would you be with this? How would you respond in this scenario and get people to start, you know, kind of thinking of like, no, you know, is this, Mm, this isn't comfortable for me. This doesn't feel right. Or, or you know, in, in certain circumstances, this could be okay. So, you know, kind of just breaking down um, different scenarios in, and um, having conversation to get people to identify, you know, where their boundaries are and what, what you know, suggested, you know, like important boundaries would be to, to kind of get into that kind of conversation. So there's just one example of how we like to keep it interactive um, as we address these topics. We ha also have lots of handouts that we use. This is one of the weeks we go through um, planning activities and dates. And although these do say during the date, et cetera, they can also be applied for planning activities. And so really whatever the participants of that group are more interested in will be kind of the way that facilitators will lean and how they deliver this information. But this is just an example of, you know, really how we break things down step by step, you know, what steps do you need to take beforehand? What do you need to do during it and after? How are you going to stay safe when you're out in the community? And and really going through each of these step by step and then, you know, the community activity of that week, we encourage facilitators to practice this, go through each of these steps and have the participants plan an activity out in the community. And so it's just an example of kind of a topic and how it's taught and then how it goes out into the community um, to be practiced. The topic of consent, you know, comes up in a lot of the different uh, sessions, as you can imagine. And so, you know, we try to bring up this topic in a variety of different ways so that people can really get the, um, you know, a good understanding about what we mean when we say consent. And this is a, you know, just a nice little acronym that Planned Parenthood has that we can try to talk about the different components of consent. This little wheel down here at the lower left, this is a, a digital um, game that we are able to play with the participants where you spin the wheel and it it might land on something that says, yes, absolutely. And we can talk about, does that sound like a good, a good strong message of consent or not? Or maybe I'll say, um, you know, just uh, shrug shoulders. And so we can say, hmm, that, that's not so convincing that that's consensual. So, you know, just again, a, a couple of the variety of, of different techniques that we have for engaging people um, who at different levels to participate in exploring some of these topics. And so another activity we do is talking about um, the Friendship or Dating Bill of Rights. So talking about what responsibility is somebody when it comes to relationships and then what they also have a right to. So this is just another example of something that you can do kind of together where you could have a blank Bill of Rights. If you saw me in parent conference, you may have ended up with one. And you can work on that together and fill these in and talk about them. What do you, what do you have a right to? And what do you have the responsibility to do? And this is really kind of in the realm of healthy relationships and kind of what people, what people's boundaries are and, and how those relate to relationships. So another, yeah, relationship deal makers and deal breakers. I like, I like that, Kelly. Well, since this video is not working, we also use a lot of videos. We um, find tons of YouTube videos and have them available for facilitators so they can kind of find different different videos that work for that group and what kind of their their interests are and what their learning styles are um, so they have a lot of options this is another another tool that we give to help talk about healthy and unhealthy relationships and being able to break it down of what is healthy what is unhealthy and then what does it look like when it is abusive and when we're going through the program we really start with talking about what is healthy and really making sure that we're talking about the positive stuff first. And then once somebody is able to identify what's healthy, then we can talk about, okay, on the other hand, what 
is unhealthy. And so the Love is Respect website is is one tool um, that can be used, as well as the Power and Control Wheel. That's something that can be filled in together. And it's just, if you're if you've never read through the power and control wheel, it's really helpful to also understand kind of that cycle of violence and how that works. So I would recommend kind of checking out these resources and getting more information. Um, again, the Love is Respect website is a great resource that we that we like to use as well as share. There's a, a portion on there for parents, but we really like the quizzes that they have. You can go on there and talk about, am I a good partner? Is my relationship healthy? Am I practicing good self-care? There's one of the quizzes where you can go and look at, it It pops up like scenarios and you can identify whether those are healthy, unhealthy, or somewhere in the middle. And so those are some some good activities to do to teach those concepts. Yeah. And I'll just, uh, before we go into sexual wellness and talk a little bit about that, just, you know, say, so some of these handouts that we're showing you are on our website for the friendship and dating program. They look obviously like there's lots of words. Um, and, uh, these are, these are, um, really resources for facilitators to have the information and to, to use it to develop interactive ways of presenting the information. So we have on our website, lots of, for example, uh, PowerPoint slide decks with images that can be used, you know, if we're talking about, does this, you know, what, what kind of, does this look, do they look happy? Do they look healthy? And, and so maybe the participants can participate by give me a thumbs up if these two are, you know, showing, you know, signs of affection or, or, or something unhealthy. So, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, or move to the side of the room where you see, um, you know, people engaged in this kind of behavior or this kind of relationship. So it's not a lot of handouts that necessarily we're relying on, um, you know, teaching off of, but lots of experiential opportunities for engaging in role play and, and that kind of thing. So just wanted to point that out. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about sexual wellness and just a little bit about it, because even though, as Katie showed you, you know, we have 10 weeks, 10 sessions, and sexual wellness is not the main point of the program. It's really developing strong interpersonal skills and what components of healthy relationships to build off of, you know, having good communication, building trust, kind of understanding, you know, uh, safety, those kinds of things before we talk about sexual wellness. Only for a brief amount of time, I wish there was more that we could dedicate to this subject, but we kind of do really boil it down to some basic factual information about people who are um, engaging in sexual activity, how to make that safer to avoid sexually transmitted infections or unwanted pregnancy. Regardless of wh whether people are sexually active or not, we think that this is important information for young adults to have uh, just factually to understand. Maybe they could always, you know, be a good friend to somebody and, and give good, strong uh, advice or information, pass it along. Or if, you know, somebody is trying to entice them to, into some kind of activity that they're not ready for, or that they can have some, you know, decision making about how to make it safer. We, we think it's very important uh, to it, give them um, some exposure to uh, things such as condoms and um, what they are, what they look like, what they feel like, different varieties, what their purpose is, for example, so that that's not um, a, a foreign uh, idea to folks. But um, so we do kind of just boil it down to some basic skills in that sense. But we're also sending the message. If you would, if you would uh, advance the slide, please, Katie. We also, you know, throughout the, the course, want to um, send the message again, kind of normalizing human sexuality and even celebrating human sexuality. A lot of times that if, if we get sexuality education, it is kind of fear-based about, oh, don't do that or else bad things will happen. And certainly, um, you know, that people do experience uh, negative, harmful sexuality, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we should also, you know, give people the perspective that this is a, a life fulfilling part of um, aspect of, of our life and it touches on so many parts of our life. 
So in this next sexuality set session, we're going to talk about the, you know sexual health, health and some basics. But we've already talked about aspects that are in these bubbles. So we're talking about different kinds of relationships people can engage in, which include same sex or different sex relationships. We already have we already have t- built um, awareness and skills around what does it mean to show someone that you care. What does it, you know, what does trust look like and feel like? We're, um, you know, going to talk about acknowledge that our bodies are, are, have natural responses and that's normal. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we understand, you know, how to manage our bodies in certain situations. And, and also, you know, talking, we've also already talked about, unfortunately, negative as aspects of sexuality where it can cause harm. So we're really kind of looking at this holistic picture of sexuality all throughout the course, um, not just in this last final session, but it's kind of baked in as we go. And we'll uh, advance the slide, please, Katie. One of the things I, I do want to say is that, you know, we don't want anybody to uh, assume that we're helping uh, reinforce these dating skills and that, the, you know, the next the next progression is to become sexually active. That's not the case for everyone. Some people are, are interested in that and some people are not. A lot of times what we, um, you know, notice is that people really are craving intimacy uh, versus sexual behavior unnecessarily. So, we want to make sure that people know that sexual intercourse is not the only option, that there are lots of safe ways that people can experience closeness and human contact and touch and togetherness that are much less risky than um, sexual intercourse. And so that's also part of the sexual wellness uh, discussion to, to, to really you know, identify that. Sometimes we can just, you know, fulfill um, our, our personal needs through other kinds of intimacy or sexual behavior that is less risky. And one of them is ma- talking about masturbation. And so we have lots of information and ways to approach the discussion about masturbation. Again, breaking it down into the different aspects of, first of all, normalizing uh, that masturbation is something that most people do. There are lots of positive benefits to masturbation. And there are uh, responsibilities to making sure that we are staying safe with it, that we're healthy in um, how we practice masturbation and um, that it's legal, right? There are um, times to, to engage in this behavior and times and places not to. And so having those conversations and supporting people to be able to engage in this healthy, normal activity um, in ways that are positive. So maybe supplying, you know, what, what they need so that they're not experimenting with things that could be damaging, for example, causing harm. Um, and, and giving them, um, you know, this is a sexual behavior that is available to all of us. And, and so it's an, it's an outlet. It's a way to, um, you know, become familiar with our bodies and, uh, and to uh, experience pleasure. That's, that's important. And so it's not always an easy conversation for guardians or caregivers to engage in, but really important. And again, to normalize and to help people up for success. Video? Or no? Yeah. So uh, again, Katie um, mentioned that we have so many video resources that include videos that are animated um, for this, you know, population videos that are people talking to people. This series, the National Council on Independent Living is sexuality conversations for people with intellectual disabilities, by people with intellectual disabilities. We have so many resources to share with you. Here's just one to kind of maybe, you know, bring up the the conversation, make some points, and this is how they do it. So we can go ahead and give that a look. Sex ed for people with IDD. Masturbation. Masturbation is when you touch your genitals or other parts of your body for sexual pleasure. Masturbation or other parts of your body for sexual pleasure. If you're not ready for sex yet, or it's not something you want to do with someone else, masturbation is a good way for you to explore your own body, experience sexual pleasure, release sexual energy and tension, reduce anxiety and stress, or even just to help you fall asleep. Masturbation is a healthy, safe, and fun activity to do if you want to feel sexual or experience sexual pleasure. 
There's no right or wrong way to masturbate. Masturbation is good for everyone, but it is important to make sure your hands or whatever else you use to touch yourself are clean before and after, and it's important that you have something to clean up with afterwards. Part of the fun of exploring yourself is making sure you stay safe. And this includes using lube so you don't chafe or irritate your skin and only putting things inside you that are meant to be put inside you like dildos or vibrators. Also, don't put your body parts inside of anything that might be unsafe. It's important you masturbate in private. That way, people you don't trust can't see your genitals. If you have any questions about masturbation, talking to a trusted adult is a great idea. Visit sex toy shops in your area and consider what's accessible for you. There are hand-free vibrators if you have trouble holding on to things. There are sex toys made of different materials if you have chemical sensitivities or allergies. And some people just like using their hands. Masturbation is not only healthy, natural, and safe to do, but what goes through your mind while you're masturbating is also a great way for self-exploration, to know what turns you on and what doesn't, and even to start exploring aspects of your sexual orientation. Just know that what the mental images are of what you masturbate to is totally valid, fine, and a part of your puberty and development, and you should not be shamed for it. Masturbation is healthy, natural, and safe. Produced by the National Council on Independent Living and Rooted in Rights, with support from the With Foundation. So that's just straight talk, right, about this subject. Um, but again, there are lots of other approaches that uh, this series, video series called Amaze. Have you, any of you heard of this video resource before? I'm seeing no from Paula. This amaze.org, their video library is very extensive. And it's, again, you can see that it's animated and um, very, you know, uh, well done in terms of approachable. And they cover almost every aspect of human sexuality that you can think of. And so um, kind of, you know, a good resource maybe for, for people that will respond to this kind of programming that's kind of fun, light, and, and very uh, informative on lots of different topics. So those are, those are resources that we use in the program as well. Oh, okay. And here's the Here's the NCIL video series. So what we just saw in different, you know, aspects of gender and identity, puberty, healthy relationships. So just dif different topics that is, you know, discussed in a, in a different way, but importantly for people with ID, um, by people with IDD. Really, that's the program in a nutshell. Um, I have just some more information and resources available. If you do want more information, we train facilitators to um, we train facilitators to implement the friendships and dating program, and so that's where we go through the curriculum all ten weeks um, and talk about how to do it. We um, I also have linked in here some toolkits. So there's a lot of really great resources out there. And so for parents who do want to be having these conversations themselves, I know that this is something that sometimes people prefer to be the ones to talk about these rather than other people. And so these are just some, some good tools. So this one is a toolkit for parents, specifically for youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And it goes through lots of different things, parent-child communication, adolescent development, internet safety, sexual assault, and just so much. And so this is really also talking about the importance and then how and when to have these conversations um, and lots of tips on, on how to do so. Another another sexual health toolkit for students with disabilities um, is linked here. This one goes through um, sexuality and self-care, relationships, social skills and boundaries, lots of tools and, and more resources there, and another. So lots of information out there. Um, this one specifically for youth with autism. Yeah, if you want more information. Planned Parenthood also has really great resources for parents. Really, these video guides are, are super helpful because they break down the different topics and uh, and give you tips on how to talk about those different topics. This resource is the Rainbow Guidebook. This was put together by individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities that identify as LGBTQIA+, and it's for supporters and educators 
to help help them to understand all of these different topics about gender and sexual orientation and how that relates to intellectual and developmental disabilities. So sometimes it's just helpful to to learn about these things yourself so that when questions do come up, you have that information. Online safety, social media is something that um, comes up a lot. It's it's a very big, real part of our everyday lives. And so it's a topic that also needs to be talked about. And so with the Friendship and Dating Program, we are currently working on an online dating and social media safety course. In addition to those 10 weeks, um, it would be a supplemental session added in. But here, these are just some other resources of of how to talk about these things. And this is just some more. So these are really just some resources that are in here so that if you are interested in in furthering this and having these conversations yourself, you have some some tools and resources available for you. I will drop this link into the chat if you wouldn't mind. I know that Lisa will probably have you fill out their evaluation, which is also fine. You don't need to do both. Do we have a few minutes for any questions or thoughts? If there are any, please feel free. We also included our contact info here um, at the end as well. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Got about five minutes left. I think we were mentioning at the beginning some opportunities to for uh, participating in the program in May. Is that uh, is that the schedule, Katie, that we have facilitators running the program? That is a Lisa question. <laughs> so what we do at CHD is we train facilitators to implement the program. Stone Soup Group has facilitators to implement, <laughs> to deliver the programs. Yeah, we're we're hoping to get a class going either the end of June, going I'm sorry, end of May, going into June. But stay tuned. We will definitely share those dates with everyone once we have it on on the calendar. We'll have one in Anchorage, and also we're we're hoping to have one in the Matsu Borough as well. There you go, Nalani. <laughs> Yeah, links um, out there in Wasilla also has trained facilitators, and so them and Stone Soup um, are trying to partner up again to do that out there as well. Stone Soup has been facilitating this course for so many years. You've all been a great promoter of just healthy relationship building in this program, so I really appreciate all of the programs that you consistently offer. Uh, well, thank you, Katie. Katie's been a driving force with that. And, and consistent and volunteering her time as well. So thank you. Yeah, I told them they can't ever really get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs>